is an acronym for that. Um, the scoring is very indicative of how the patient is going to fare after delivery. Uh, so when the baby comes out, you have a zero, uh, at one minute, you score them at one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15. Once you get to normal scores, uh, like an eight, uh, between seven and 10, you can stop scoring them. But at the beginning, you score until you get to that eight to 10, every five minutes. Um, so activity, um, that's your muscle tone. Are they flaccid? Are they tight? A newborn baby should be arms up in the air, feet clenched in, especially if they're stressed and there's nothing swaddling them. And that's uh, the Moro reflex, right? No, the Moro is when you pull them off the bed and they do this. What's the one where they look like they're marching like that? What's that one called? Uh, that, when you pull them up off the bed and they go back to that, that's the Moro. Their normal flex tone should be their hands are close to their oh, face. Okay. That's just how they hold. Um, now, when they come out and they're distressed and they have poor muscle tone, they'll just flop out. Okay. Um, the other thing that you, with the muscle tone and holding it in, gestational age is a factor. Um, as you develop in your in utero, your brain is developing and making those connections of how the natural reflexes. So if you have a 25 weeker, they're going to be out here. Um, and as they get older, it comes in. Um, same thing with the legs. Um, pulse. Do they have one? That's, so you give the points accordingly. You see the, the scale. Um, pulse, do they have one? The easiest way to do that is either grab the umbilical stump and count it that way. You count it for six seconds. Um, and then times about 10. Um, I have a problem with that. My fingers are thick and I can't get a hold. Their pulses are very faint. So my fingers are thick and I can't count. Uh, so I just put a stethoscope and count the heart. Um, so if you have... If you are, cannot feel that pulse in a very quick time, stethoscope on the heart and listen, okay? Um, no pulse, it's a zero. Below 100, it's one. Over 100, it's two. Um, grimace, that's their ir irritability. Are they crying? Are they pissed off? Are they mad at what you're doing? Um, because what we're doing is not nice. We're suctioning that, we're stimulating them. That's not nice. So they should grimace. Um, so if they're not doing anything, you know, you give them a zero. If they have some movement to that, one. Um, if they're doing exactly what they're supposed to, two. Um, skin color, appearance, blue and pale, zero. Um, now this, the appearance is usually where we lose points. That's why everybody's an eight and a nine. Um, you should never have a baby that starts out at 10 um, unless somebody's giving them oxygen as they're coming out of the vaginal canal. Um, it takes a while to get the, the, the blue to go away. Um, so the appearance is not as important as the rest of them. Um, so usually that's why they get off. And then of course you have acrocyanosis. They're always gonna be blue in their hands and the feet. So don't really pay attention to their hands and feet. Go to trunk. Um, respirations. This is the one that's tricky. Um, so zero is absent. If they're agonal breathing, that's still absent. Um, they have to be making some kind of respiratory effort uh, to get a one point. Um, and then if they're crying, they get a two. Um, it has to be, it's gonna be irregular and it might be slow, but they have to, it has to have some kind of rhythm. It's not just the, okay. Uh, so there's that, that's your APGARS. Normal baby is usually an eight or a nine. That's what we usually give them. Um, nine, maybe 10, if somebody gave them O2 at delivery. Uh, you know you're gonna have some serious issues if, you're, if you get a zero or a one. Um, that means you're probably doing some resuscitation. I don't know, oh, because I'm, there we go. <clears throat> All right, so assessments. We're gonna do airway and breathing first. I made the C small um, because I know in ACLS and PALS and BLS, we are doing the cab effect. On a neonate, it's not cab. 
it's airway and breathing. If you don't have your airway and you're not breathing for them, you're never going to get your circulation. All right. Um, their airways are small and anterior. They're all at the top. Where we set down, they're all at the top. So any positioning you can do to help them out, if they're having some breathing problems, the better. Um, that's their natural position. Um, so that closes off their airway completely. Um, you can pull back, you know, give them some chin support. And then also you can uh, give them a neck and shoulder roll. Open that airway up, get it open. Um, there is a point where you open it too much and because they're so anterior, you close it down if you hyperflex them too much. They're obligate nose, nose breathers. They're not gonna breathe out of their mouth. So if they have something that's blocking their nose, that's, that's when you, you, know, you need to go in and fix it. Um, so when we get a baby to the warmer bed or they're going to mom and you're doing the suction, how, what do we suction first? Mouth and Mouth. nose. Mouth and nose. Because uh, if you go for that nose, they're going to suck in anything they had in that, uh, their oral phoenix first. Um, and that could be a big old plug of meconium. It could be something gross that we don't want in the lungs. Um, why did I put that? Is there? Oh, you need to know if their anatomy is normal. Um, so with kiddos, we can see these defects that are actually quite regular. Pierre Robin is basically just a recessed chin and a large tongue. Um, there's people walking around every day with this syndrome and don't know they have it. Um, only the real severe cases that we pick up on. Um, and so what happens is their tongue is so large, it flops back and completely obstructs their airway. Um, the way you fix this is you turn, turn them prone. Everything falls forward and they breathe fine. If you have a baby that breathes fine, sats fine on their belly, they probably have pure ribbon. Uh, coenal atresia, that's where your nose is bl blocked. So these kids, they're obligate nose breathers. They're not gonna breathe. Uh, so, um, try an oral airway. If that doesn't work, you might have to intubate them. Um, tracheal malaysia, uh, tracheal stenosis, um, laryngeal malaysia, all of these are the floppy airway, um, uh, closed off airway syndrome. You're not going to see this very often in the right after delivery. This is something we find either they've been intubated for too long or that kind of thing. Um, oh, and they bite. I just thought that was cool. Cutest yeah. picture on the planet. Uh, so breathing. The rate is 30 to 60 times a minute. Um, however, let's see if this works. They do not have a regular rhythm. Um, this is usually what gets us panicked in the ER. Can everybody see that? I wish the camera was up moving. You can watch the VR shirt. Yeah. So they do not have <gasps> the neurosensory integration well enough yet to completely regulate their own breathing. So they'll breathe fast and they'll slow down. And sometimes I have like periods of apnea. If it's not greater than 20 seconds, it's not real apnea. Um, we see this a lot in the ER. Parent, new parents come in and they're like, oh, my baby's not breathing. Well, they were, they were just breathing the way they normal breathing. Um, uh, depth and accessory muscle use. This is all very important. Um, if you have if they're tachypneic, this is probably where you're going to see more. We call it transient tachypnea of the newborn. Um, they're going to breathe very shallow, but very fast. If they are breathing, they are breathing. Um, not necessarily do you have to bag them or stop them. Let them do it on their own. Um, the deep slow respirations are probably more concerning. That's probably when they're getting ready to give up. Um, retractions, substernal, subcostal, intercostal, and supraclavicular. Um, everybody know what those are, what those look like? Okay. Um, I think I have. Oh, 
back. So this little guy, I think he was going to be my grunting too. So that's pretty There's significant. A, uh, there's volume on there too. Accessory muscle use. Hit the one on the left, the left speaker. Uh, yeah. There you go. You can cut it on, cut it up. It works pretty good. We used it for uh, heart sounds. You can actually hear the grunting too in this video pretty well. Um, so subcostal, substernal. No, stop. Subcostal, substernal. Um, they did not have any supraclavicular retractions. To be honest, when I see supraclavicular retractions, that makes me more nervous. If they're doing the suprasternal and supraclavicular, they are pulling real hard. Um, so they're using everything they got, all all their stuff. They compensate very well. However, I think it, you get a little action here, a little inappropriate videography. So this is TTN. This is what I was talking about, the trans newborn. We didn't need to see that. Um, they breathe probably 80 to 100 times a minute. That's not abnormal. Uh, it happens more often than not. Um, and it's slow, it's, it's shallow, and it's fast. Um, pay attention if it gets to that deep uh, respirations and they start grunting um, and that kind of stuff, you might be getting to the point where they're, gonna, they're tired out. Transtachypnea of the newborn really starts uh, because the delivery was either too fast or it was a C-section and they still have a whole lot of fluid in their lungs um, and that's what you get. They're trying to get it out. They don't have a whole lot of room. Nasal flaring, everybody's seen nasal flaring. Breast sounds. Um, are they even? Um, are they bilateral and even? Um, there's, we've heard of the horror stories of the diaphragmatic hernia. That's when there's a hernia usually on the left side uh, in the diaphragm and they're, uh, their intestines are in their chest. Um, so if you hear it, it's not even, you hear bowel sounds in the, the chest, you got a problem. Um, also, pneumos happen, especially spontaneous pneumos, happen in like 10% of all births. Um, they cry, that birth is stressful. Um, so sometimes you have un uneven breast sounds. Now we do not treat pneumos if they're not symptomatic. They just go away. If they're symptomatic, then that's a whole different thing. Uh, of course, premature infants um, lack surfactant. Um, surfactant is stuff that um, basically gives us surface tension in our aviola. So premature infants, they lack surfactant. So their aviola stick together. Um, so when you hear us talking about coarse breath sounds, it is like they're pulling sandpaper apart. Um, so in a premature infant, that's not necessarily un <coughs> unnormal. Um, even if you get those kiddos um, that are, they're a couple weeks out from being in the NICU and that kind of stuff, they might have those breast sounds for a while. Um, it's not abnormal. Grunting, we just heard that, I think. I have another good video. Now, going back to where you said even, how hard is it to hear bowel sounds in a neonate considering they haven't eaten? Are they still active bowel sounds? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you'll hear it. It tinkles. It's just, still? Okay. Yeah, just like regular bowel sounds. This is this was a good video of grunting. And good video of nasal flaring. More than likely, this kiddo um, came out too fast. Uh, so grunting, uh, kids are amazing at compensating for their lacks. Um, so they're trying to maintain their functional residual capacity. It's what's left over in the lungs. Um, so they're basically auto-peeping themselves. They're giving themselves CPAP. So they're using their vocal cords to hold back some of their stuff. Um, Strider. Um, we don't see this very often in neonates. Um, usually if we have a strider problem, we, we had that tracheal malaysia 
or we have done something surgically to them. It's high pitched. Um, and it's different from grunting. It doesn't have that prolonged, that's why I did the strider. It, uh, Cause a lot of, some people are like, it's strider, no, it's grunting. Um, so the difference between the two is the pitch of it, um, how long it lasts. All right. Any questions about breath sounds? Um, special considerations, prematurity, um, and surfactant deficiencies. Uh, so you don't start developing normal amounts of surfactant until you're like 34 weeks. Um, you start develop. You don't start developing it at all until you're about 27 weeks. Um, and surfactant is very important. Uh, that's why we give it on a regular basis. Um, How do you we, give that? Um, ET tube. You intubate them. Um, we have a ballard that connects to it. You pull up your medicine. Make sure it's warm, because if you don't, it's that's a problem. Make sure it's warm. Beat it down. Um, and then do you like kind of just? You turn like, them on each turn side. The baby. Yep. We don't shake the baby. No, I don't shake the baby. So. We used to do. We, Why not? <laughs> I mean, we used to slap the babies. No? Yeah. We don't shake babies. We stimulate them now. But, uh, so we used to do four aliquots, and which was ridiculous. And studies so showed that that was not. There's no purpose. Um, so we just do right and left side, and they stay on there for a minute. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when you're giving surfactant, you have to be aware that um, the surfactant comes back. Uh, so you have to make sure you up your ventilator settings or bag it in. Uh, surfactant deficiencies that would be in a term neonate. Um, the TTN kid is basically a surfactant deficiency kid. He's washed out with amniotic fluid. So even though they're producing enough surfactant and they have it, if they are getting washed out, they don't have it. Um, meconium aspirations, blood aspirations. If you ever get a blood aspiration, that's bad news bears. That is, that's harsh. Uh, meconium aspirations is something we see a lot. Um, the old way of doing it is you would, if you saw the meconium stain at delivery, you would intubate this kid and suck the meconium out. We do not do that anymore. No more intubations. Because what, you have to do that before they cry. Um, before they oh, take a breath. Um, and it was just not going down and people were causing trauma with intubating. So now we suck it out of the nose, we suck it out of the airway, but we do not suck it out of the lungs itself. Everybody know what meconium is? Yeah, okay. Um, congenital anomalies, we talked about uh, some of the airway anomalies. Um, the other things that we uh, see relatively frequently, like I said, the diaphragmatic hernias, um, you see a lot, uh, we don't see a lot of them, T the TE fistulas, it's where the trachea and the esophagus have a fistula between them. Um, so if they have that, they're aspirating, um, they might, sometimes the, um, the esophagus is uh, completely cut off, um, and if you're bagging those kids, um, you're bagging up a big balloon in their chest, okay? Esophageal atresia, atresia. Uh, birth trauma. Um, there's, a, like I said, the pneumos, um, that kind of stuff. Birth is hard on everybody, um, so a lot of things can go wrong. Um, look for if there's a birth injury that affects their neuro status, that might affect your breathing status. Uh, Resuscitation injuries, that's usually related to overbagging. Uh, that's why we have the T-piece resuscitator. We can go ahead and talk about that. Um, the T-piece resuscitator is what we use in deliveries now. Um, it's an NRP standard. Um, the great thing about these guys um, is that you can set a peep uh, and give CPAP. Um, and you can set a PIP on these guys not to overdo it. Um, we think this is a neonate, this is a sick baby, and we want to help them out, and we're doing this, and then we just gave them more 
uh, more problems. We're either causing bear trauma that they're going to have issues later in life, or we just cause the pneumo that we're going to have to fix later. Um, so you can set your PIP so you're not doing, uh, not having any bear trauma. You can test it prior, get a nice PEEP, because uh, sometimes all they need is a little CPAP. Um, we'll, we'll hook that up to the isolate and go over that later. Uh, cardiac defects. Um, some kids come out blue and they're always going to be blue. Um, the, if we know that there's a congenital heart defect, um, sometimes that helps us not give too much oxygen, that helps us not overbreathe for them. Because if they're breathing, that's great. Um, and they're going to be blue. We know they're going to be blue. Um, they're mixing blood, so there you go. Now, besides surfactant, is there any other medication you would give for a respiratory emergency for a neonate, or are y'all more focused on that they're coming out breathing? Uh, yeah, that's like it. they're not necessarily going to have bronchospasms at that age or anything no. like that that we'd see in adults. No, so. you wouldn't see. We wouldn't be given albuterol or anything like that. So as long as they're breathing, they're good respiratory. Mm -hmm. And then we support them either with CPAP or the ventilator. Okay. Um, now, in the events of Strider and they have an airway narrowing, and this is a kid that's still a neonate but has left the hospital, then we can talk about giving, like, racemic epi or that kind of thing. But that's, that's more... That's less common kind of thing. Very, okay. yeah. It would, you know, the epiglottitis or the crew scenario. So, main thing, make sure they're breathing, give them O2, and surfactant's, like, the main drug that y'all would... Yeah, see. and we're gonna, we're gonna discuss the O2 thing here in just a minute with the NRP, because O2 is not necessarily something we give regularly. Uh, circulation. Heart rate's usually between 120 and 160. If you have one of those big, giant babies and their heart rate's 110 and their cap refill is good and their blood pressure is good, that's okay. Um, anything over 220 and sustained, um, that's when we question SVT. Um, for us, as far as rhythms goes in the neonate, very rarely do you see anything other than fast and slow. Um, that's, that's the only thing you're going to see. And when you have a heart rate of 220 and above, whether they have P waves or not, it's questionable. It's, too, it's really hard to see a P wave if your heart rate's going at 220. Um, color. Um, like I said, they, they naturally have acrocyanosis. That's the blue hands, blue feet. That is normal. Um, they should be pink, um, or appropriate to their ethnicity. Um, even dark skinned babies come out light and they should be pink. Um, if you can't tell, look at their mucous membranes. Um, pale is bad. That means they've lost blood. So where they lost it, we don't know. Um, whether it's either they're losing it inside their body or they're losing, or in their head, or they've lost it during delivery. Um, pulses. Um, it's hard to find pulses on a baby. Um, first place you should check during the delivery care is the umbilical cord. Make sure they have a pulse there. Um, if you can't get a hold of their uh, femoral pulses, uh, try their postibular pulses. That's usually a pretty good spot. Um, are brachials developed at that age? Yeah, all okay, of it's so, developed. It's just hard to find. Okay. Yeah. So brachial and carotid are Yeah, good. some people, I have thick um, pads on my fingers. So sometimes I have a hard time. Don't push down. It's just like lightly lay your finger upon where your pulse should be. Mm -hmm. um, if you push down at all, you've cut off the pulse and you're not going to feel it. Okay. <clears throat> uh, some people have a better luck finding the femoral pulses than I do, but um, post tips for me are usually where where it's at when I'm, I'm assessing lower extremities. Um, radial pulses are usually pretty easy to find. The brachial pulses are easy to find, but naturally they're like this. Uh, so you're pulling them down and you're also stretching that out. So if you put any pressure on that brachial pulse, you might not feel it. So check your radials and your uh, post tip pulses. Um, and now if your radial and your pulse tip pulses are bad, you probably want to move up to a bigger pulse. Um, cap refill, so important, so important in the neonate, because um, that's one of the first things they try, uh, 
they start shunting centrally. Um, so if you have a poor cap refill, they've already started the shunting process. Um, that the cap refill starts getting delayed very early and signs of shock or cardiac defect. Uh, I put temperature here. We're going to talk more about temperature. Um, temperature in a neonate is very important. A little cold stress can put them right under. Um, weather, sometimes you think other things are going wrong, but really and truly, they were just cold. Um, so keep them warm. Keep them warm. Any way you can keep them warm, that's not burning them. Um, so we assess BPs. Um, so that's very, uh, normal BPs are very hard to explain um, in the diastolic, systolic way. So what we do is the mean arterial pressure should be equal or greater than their gestational age. Um, who came up with that? And how? Um, we don't know, but it works. Um, and it gives us a good uh, indication that they are perfusing all their body parts. Uh, so that is it's what you go by. If not, that's when we need to start thinking uh, fluid resuscitations, blood products, dopamine, butamine, that kind of thing. Uh, heart sounds. Um, murmurs. So murmurs doesn't necessarily mean they have a cardiac defect. Um, do the murmurs come and go? Murmurs should be an added thing to the picture. Um, if you have a lot of these that are bad and you have a murmur, maybe we have a cardiac defect. If the kiddo has a murmur, it just might mean he hasn't transitioned all the way to normal, uh, normal circulation. Uh, four quadrant blood pressures. Um, four quadrant blood pressure, excuse me. Four pro, uh, quadrant blood pressures are very helpful in determining if you have a massive cardiac defect. Um, if you have a difference between your upper extremities and your lower extremities, and it's significant, um, something is blocking the flow to the bottom. Uh, you might have a transposition of the great vessels. You might have a left uh, hypoplastic heart. Um, these things. It, it will give you, it will start taking you down the road of there might be a significant cardiac defect. Um, your pre and post SpO2. Um, your pre-ductal and post-ductal SpO2. Um, they do that CCHD, the congenital uh, heart defect test before everybody goes home. They put a pulse ox pre-ductal. That is your anything, it's your right arm, okay? Postductal is in everything else, okay? The ductus that they're talking about is the um, the PDA, the uh, patent ductus arteriosus. It's the the duct that is mixing the blood for you. Um, this is above that, so this will be different. This sat will be different than your left foot. A lot of people do right hand, left foot. Um, it doesn't matter as long as it's right hand. Anything else. Uh, so when you go into a nursery and they put an IV in that right hand, you're going to have to untape it. It just happened to me last week. <laughs> All right. You say IV. Is IV more common in BBs or IO? Oh, we don't do IOs. You don't do we, IOs? Um, you can. You can do an IO. Um, umbilical vein? We do. And so as far as IV access... Um, IOs are never our go-to. Um, you can if you if that is that is all you can get. You can. Um, that needle's got to be what, like yay big. Um, we only use a jam sheety. You do not drill babies. Um, I think CPTS policy is anything less than six months. You use a jam sheety. The problem is all their bones are cartilage, so it's real hard to get. And you're only going in that one bone. It's real hard to get a IO into that. So as newborn care, we do the emergency umbilical vein. Um, you have a big vein access right there, and it's super easy to get something in there. Um, the only thing is you just have to be checked off to do it. Um, cool. The 
that is the emergent access. Um, if you can get an IV, that's great. If you can't, that's fine. Um, now just remember, in babies, you can go almost everywhere. Um, you can go to the head, you can go to the feet, you can go to the hands, you know. We try to stay away from the big vessels in case they need a central line, but that's just us. Um, but you can go there. Yes, if, if that's what you get, that's what you get. I mean, because technically we could stick like a 20. It'd be a bad idea, but you could do it. Uh, we do not do EJs on neonates. Don't. Uh, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why so we don't anywhere do... anywhere but <laughs> neck and thighs. Yeah, try to stay away from the brachials if you can. I mean, the uh, ACs if you can. Um, now, the reason why <laughs> this is a poor example of a baby um, because they have even less neck than this. Mm -hmm. And if you're trying to put an EJ in a baby, mm -hmm. one, everything's very close together. So good luck hitting the right vessel. Two, you're right there on top of your clavicle. So if you move just a little bit in, you've given the baby a new mount. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to keep them. They do this. So keeping that catheter straight is almost impossible. So head, arms, mm -hmm. legs, those are good spots. Scalps. The cephalics are usually really nice. Yeah. Mm. Scalps, feet, hands. That's the, the best access. Okay. Um, if you can try not to get access, that's even better. If your baby just happens to live. Um, but if you're given emergency drugs, you can also give that epi through the ET tube. Um, so if you don't feel comfortable putting a UVC in, epi through the ET tube would be the next route. Uh, normal cardiac, I just threw that up there. We all know how it comes in through the atrium, through the ventricle, up through the pulmonary arteries returns from the pulmonary veins into the left ventricle and out to the body. We put that up there because it gets really crazy in fetal circulation. Uh, so in fetal circulation, it is coming through the umbilical cord. Um, it goes through the umbilical cord into the inferior vena cava, and then it comes in, um, and then it goes through the ductus for a moa valley, and then it mixes. And then it goes up, and then it mixes again near the ductus arteriosus. So there's lots of mixing. There's lots of holes. There's lots of things that can go wrong, and they do. There it is again. Uh, cardiac anomalies. If you have, there's multiples, like the transposition, um, you know, ductuses that are open and that are not closing. Most common you see. Hum? Most common one you see. Most common. Is the patent PDA or well, transition? The PDA is common for us because we do we'll deal with premature infants. Mm -hmm. um, and it just takes that a little while to close. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you have, say, like a left hypoplast um, or a transposition, anything that sometimes you need that PDA to stay open because that is what's saving that kid's life. That's when you would give prostaglandins. Prostaglandins keep the PDA open, um, allowing that mixing to happen because um, you're maintaining fetal circulation, basically. Um, we see a lot of PPHN, which is persistent pulmonary hypertension. We throw that PPPHN, that extra P on there, um, because in utero, they're in pulmonary hypertension naturally um, because they don't, they're not breathing in. So there's no gas exchange through the lungs. So they don't need a whole lot of vasculature uh, open up in their lungs. So they shut that down so they can sh shunt that blood in the heart and mix it. Uh, if they're not shunting, then, you know, obviously blood f flows downhill or to the, you know, lower gradient. There's not any uh, shunting there. I've not not any hypertension there, it's not going to shunt appropriately. So what happens when they come out and we've messed up with a meconium aspiration or they have another congenital heart defect or they just have really crappy lungs, those lungs are like, well, hey, they're not working anyways, we're going to clamp down. Uh, that's when we give nitric. Uh, nitric oxide, the INO system, um, relaxes those vessels, opens it up, allows the oxygen to get through. Shock, um, cardiac, sepsis, shock. Um, so you're gonna see some shunting. Uh, you're gonna see poor cap refill. Um, 
let's see, hypovolemic shock, you're gonna, you know, they've bled out. So you need to fix that. First line, just some normal saline bolus, 10 per kilo, not 20, 10 per kilo for a neonate. Um, the reason we do the 10 per kilo is because we don't know if they have a cardiac defect and we don't want to overload them. Um, underlining respiratory issues will affect your cardiac issues. And that's the bolus rate. Is there a set rate that y'all use for like drips and keeping them at that way or do you just kind of titrate it to each baby? What, for the normal saline? Mm -hmm. See, we don't give normal saline as a... Um, as a norm bolus? It's just we, no, we just give it as a bolus. Okay. These kiddos, as their maintenance fluids, will get D10 and D5. Okay. Yeah, because they need the sugar. Um, so if you... If you think you have a... If you're having a massive blood pressure issue, you're having a massive thing, give, give the... Push it. It's like... It depends on the size of the baby. It's like 20 mLs. Um, now, if you do not, if this is not critical, we're not life-saving moment, but we have a little bit of low blood pressure and we can slow it down, you want to give it over 30 minutes. Um, the reason why, if you're pushing stuff in, you're changing, uh, you're, you're pushing fluid up. Um, and it's changing their intracranial pressure and their vasculature and their brain is very sensitive and it pops. Um, so you can get yourself some interventricular hemorrhages if you are shifting their blood pressure too, too much. And we're very slow on all of that, if you can be slow. Now, if it's, we have to get something in now because, the, you know, I am white as a sheet and I have no cap refill and my heart's, you know, in the 50s, give the fluid. Awesome. Now for the last 15 minutes of recording, do you want to finish with this or it cuts off automatically at 8.30? Do you sure. want to go over isolate stuff? So Wait, we, what would you all like to go over? I kind of like to see the isolate because that's not something that any of our providers see sure. every day. I think it's kind of cool. And let the PowerPoint's me, online. Let me do the, we'll go past neuro. Okay. Uh, cause that's... We do cover, like, we cover fontanelles with sutures was kind of cool when I read that. Mm -hmm. I was like, what, sutures? Um, know your subgalian bleeds. Mm -hmm. Um, your subgalian bleeds are a birth injury, usually from vacuuming, um, or the cervix clamps down on the head. Oh. Um, kind of go over the different layers of the tissue in the head, but basically this, you, you've ruptured an artery in the skull. Um, and this blood is coming out, and it's not going to stop. Um, so these kids start out with maybe a little bump, uh, maybe a little cephalohematoma, um, mm -hmm. but then this bleed just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It goes past the suture line. Mm -hmm. Their ears will poke out mm -hmm. um, because the blood is so bad. This doesn't stop. This is a medical emergency. Um, usually these kids don't make it. And of course, you've heard the horror stories of the internal decapitation of the forceps. So you see that these ears are poking out. Mm -hmm. um, the difference is like this stops. It probably this is just a cap. It, it probably doesn't cross the suture lines. This does, and it doesn't stop. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Usually, they have neuro issues. Um, you all won't see myelomeningocele's. Hydrocephalus, you won't see that either, probably. Uh, newborn care, keep them dry. Uh, if it's a term baby, keep them dry. Um, bold syringe, mouth, then nose. Um, keep them warm. Skin to skin is probably the best way to keep them warm. If not, use a radiant warmer. Warm blankets, hat. Cold stress is a big deal. Uh, cord cutting. Just read over that. NRP. That's what I wanted to hit first. That's what I wanted to hit along cool. the thing. Um, so back to the oxygen. Your oxygen delivery. Um, you're you're going to want to put a pulse ox on that preductal, that right hand. Um, and normal babies, normal babies are not going to have an SpO2 of normal value. They're coming out. They don't need it. Um, so you don't have to give oxygen. Um, so at one minute, you have 60 to 65. That should be your sats. 
two minutes, 65 to 70, and it goes up every minute by about 5%. By 10 minutes, you should be in normal range, but it does not have to be normal at the beginning. So you do not have to start out. This is a term maybe. You do not have to give them 100% oxygen when they hit that thing. Let them do it themselves. Um, oxygen is a drug. It is toxic. It can hurt their eyes. It can hurt their lungs. So hold off. Um, so do they have good tone? Just, uh, yes, you go into routine care. Warm. Clear the airway, drop, stimulate. If the heart rate is below 100 or gasping, you start your CPAP or your positive pressure breathing. You know? Um, if you can't fix it with the PPV or the CPAP, then, and then the heart rate is still below 100, keep going with the positive. If it gets below 60, that's when you start to chest compressions. So chest compressions. Um, three to one. All right, count it out. Um, either the two thumb method um, on a preemie, on a real small baby, um, your thumbs will probably cross over. So just use the two fingers. Okay. So the difference between NRP and ACLS and PALS and all that stuff is that we assess every 30 seconds. Um, so you get the baby on the isol on the warmer bed, you clear and dry and stimulate them. Their heart rate is below a hundred or gasping. You start PPV, then you wait through 30 seconds. If the PPV isn't working, then you move on, um, to, if your heart rate is still below a hundred, you keep going. If your heart rate drops below 60, that's when you start preparing for your emergent UBC. Um, and you start your chest compressions. All these things happen in 30 second increments. Um, we count for six seconds, not 10, and you multiply by 10, okay? Questions about that? I recommend everybody go to the class. We have it, it's yeah. required for the ground program. Good. Uh, stable, that was the other thing. Um, so we have a class that we take, uh, stable. Uh, the first thing is sugar. Um, you should have a sugar greater than 45. Um, so if you walk up onto a neonate, um, they should have a blood sugar. Um, Cause what you're walking up onto is probably a stressed out neonate. Um, you should walk, you should take a blood sugar. Um, if you're going to Stonewall, they don't have a delivery and you're picking up a neonate, actually you all won't, but if you're in that vicinity and you're helping them out um, and their sugar is less than 45, try feeding him. Wait half an hour, wait 45 minutes. If it's not let, if it's not greater than 45 at that point, then that's when we need to start putting an IV in. So you're not worried about aspiration or NPO or any of that necessarily? You're if it's a term baby. If it's term, just let them. Good feed time. them. They need food. That's why their sugar is low. Okay. Feed them. Um, if they're not eating, you can drop an NG tube and feed them that way. Um, but feed them. Um, if it is still less than 45, we do D10. Um, I hate that they put this up here. Um, we do D10. We do. We start out at 80 mLs per kilo per day, um, which I think is usually an average of 2 mLs per kilo an hour. Okay. Oh, the bolus. Uh, they, that's just a bolus. So your D10 bolus is 2 mLs per kilo. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't read the whole sentence. 2 mLs per kilo is your bolus. So feed them, start the IV, give them a D10 bolus. D10, not D25, not D50. I don't know how many times have we've seen that. That will just burn up their veins and it causes more trouble than it's worth. D10. Uh, Times two. If you do not fix it in that time two, that's when you need to start the IV, um, and that's when you do the 80 per kilo and that kind of stuff. Um, at that point, you definitely should have a neonatologist on the phone um, helping you out, okay? Temperature. Temperature is so, so, so important. That's why we carry the 300 pound isolate. Um, use porter warmers, the, the, uh, the chemical gel mattresses. Use those, use a radiant warmer, keep them warm. Cold stress is bad. 
Uh, where to go? Um, airway, blood pressure, lab work, and emotional support. Uh, so temperature, keep them dry. Keep them above 97.8. Um, the radiant warmers have servo controls. They have a little tempro. Make sure they're on. I can't tell you how many times that I have found them off and just the warmer on. Um, the temp probes are super important. You don't want to get them hot either. So if they're too warm, then um, that causes lots of issues as well. Uh, use a portal warmer if necessary. Those are the, the chemical mattresses. Um, hypothermia protocol, if you have a hypoxic um, ischemic encephalopathy, don't worry about that. As far as ground providers, it doesn't need to be started and for six hours. Um, we just passively cool them. We let them get cold. We usually don't know unless we... They have very specific criteria. The neonatologist can walk you through that. Airways, we went through over airways. You can start nasal cannulas, start blow by, give them a little oxygen. Um, the T piece will do blow by. Uh, nasal cannula, we do not use oxy hoods anymore, but if that's what you got, that's what you got. Uh, CPAP and ET2. Um, we always do pressure, we don't do volume. Um, so when you're doing PPV, your pressure should be about 20 over five. Um, your respiratory rate should be about 40. Um, blood pressure, we talked about the estimated gestation age. We talked about the normal saline boluses of uh, 10 mLs per kilo. Dopamine and dobutamine, call a provider before you get that far. Um, the lab work, um, we do a CBC. Uh, we won't go through all the CBC stuff, um, but it could be infection. Um, if you're, if you so happen to get a great amount of blood, please, 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 please draw a CBC in a blood culture, because um, we can't give antibiotics until we get the uh, get the blood culture done. Can you draw that from like an umbilical cord after you cut it, or no? Um, only if you're doing sterile. We do it when I, if I'm doing sterile lines, then that's when I draw okay. it. Um, I'll say because we cut it anyways, and then there's blood there, so no. No, um, <clears throat> no, it's, no, no. Because it's dirty at that point. Gotcha. So your blood culture would be messed up. And it's half a mom's blood too. And the, the blood culture in the CBC really needs to come from baby. Um, emotional support. This is just funny. Birth is not natural. And your body is expelling a foreign parasite. Didn't uh, I tell you Emma was a parasite? Yeah. Little oh, alien. Alright. Transport. So you all know who, how, when, where. So our isolate. Take pizza warmer, pizza box off. Um, our isolate is set up with everything that we possibly could use. Um, monitors. Um, this is our thermoregulation center. Um, so isolates have a fan under them, and it circulates that heat. That's why it's double walled. Um, so there's two pieces in there. If you don't have that double wall, the warm air is going to get out. Um, if you have a premature baby, he, they have um, no brown fat to keep them warm. Um, brown fat is a special fat that they use for thermoregulation. They don't know how to shiver. They can't shiver to stay warm. That's how we stay warm. They can't do it. Um, so if you have a real preemie, they haven't developed the brown fat yet. Um, so wrap them. Use a isolate. Use a servo. Um, the, with our isolate is probably as far as securing. Um, we have a special gel mattress in here that helps absorb the shock of the road. Um, then it's a five point restraint system. Uh, one goes over the shoulders, the other one goes over the shoulders, and then we have one on each leg. Uh, unfortunately, this setup is not fantastic for the micro preemies because they don't fit. Um, they're, this is all stuff. So get them secured as best you can. Um, we also come prepared with a ventilator. Um, this is our cross vent. It's just a regular pressure. Well, it's a volume ventilator, but we set we can set pressure limits on this guy. Um, and then we come with uh, high frequency ventilation. Um, so with our preemies or your heart defects or some uh, other issues, um, high frequency ventilation basically just keeps the lungs open, pumps the air in, um, and this is a passive exhalation. We call it a flow interrupter. So it's shoving air in at 
like rates of 300 breaths per minute, 400 breaths per minute, just maintaining that air and pulling the gases in and out. That's uh, maintaining the, the surface area, allowing more gas exchange. Uh, let's see, we have tanks that we can hook to the wall. Um, I would have brought the nitric over here, but they're going out, so we only have the one nitric system. The nitric system can hook up to both the cross vent or the TXP. Um, let's see, that's basically the isolate. It's real easy. It's, it looks like this big piece of complicated machinery. It's not. Um, make sure it's always plugged up. Make sure it's always on. Um, if you ever run with us or whatever, make sure the isolate's warm. Um, I, when you get to a neonate and your isolate's cold, you have to wait until your isolate warms up. Um, we carry syringe pumps. Uh, just for the volume that we use, syringe pumps work better in transport. The plumb pumps are work because they're big and they're bulky and we usually need multiple syringe pumps. Um, that's basically the isolate. Um, the other thing with, we talked about the T-piece resuscitator. Um, I can't stress this enough, you all don't have them, but these, if you're going to a delivery facility, they should. We've, we've done our best to do outlining education to start this. When you, when you start a T-piece resuscitator, make sure you close it off. The peep is adjusted at the blue. Um, make sure you turn it on, hook it to the oxygen, turn it to about eight liters, okay? Adjust your peep based off what you got here. Um, and then all the breathing is done right here. You just need one finger. And for that one, our NRP said you put it in the green area for the peep, right? That's yep. all that matters? It's um, not like a, you, it's so like a the, set number. It's there's like a, a number a, here. Mm -hmm. You want to hit about 20. Okay. Um, you want to hit it. If you're hitting 15, you're not probably not giving enough breath. Um, hit about 20. Look for chest rise. The sicker kids, when you have problems, you might have to turn that pressure up. Okay. Um, sometimes the kids' lungs are stiff or they're not working right, so you have to turn the pressure up. Sometimes kids prefer a longer eye time, uh, so you hold it down just a little longer. Um, that gives them more breath to get oxygen in. Um, some kids need a shorter, shorter eye time. They need more time to expel the CO2, so that's just a little tiny breath. Okay, About 40 times a minute. Okay. Um, the pressure is adjusted here at the bottom. And it's still color coded red, it green, is, yellow. Yes, it is color, color coded red, green, yellow. Because a lot of people, we don't see them very often, so I like that, that they have the color. Yeah, code. yeah. Here, please play. Yeah. I think I see this thing once a year when I go to that class, and that's it. Yeah. It's kind of like, um, yeah. Yeah, anytime, anytime you want to come over and look at stuff, we got we got it. The, um, when you're Especially putting, when we go out to places that have never heard of these things, like Pioneer or somewhere. Oh, like right, right, right. Yeah. I love that place. Now they have the flow inflated bags. I'm not the flow inflated bag. The self inflated bags, um, they work. Just remember, you're not going to be able to give CPAP and you're not going to be able to give blow by through the mask. You have to go from the bottom to give the blow by. And don't try to do CPAP. I've seen it happen. You're suffocating the baby. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, just remember, they're not expelling a whole lot of air, and there's no holes here to help you get CO2 out unless you're breathing for them. Um, so the self-inflated bag, if you're just holding it on the thing, they're just rebreathing CO2. Um, same thing with just everybody else, the E and the C, to hold the airway open. Mm -hmm. um, get behind that chin. Make sure you have a. Make sure you're pulling back. Okay. Um, make a nice seal, and that's one at a time. Okay, um, like I said, put a chest roll under there, a neck roll or a shoulder roll, and that's going to help you open this airway. Um, let's see. Uh, questions about the isolate? Questions about anything you see? That's cool. I like that. So the isolate has the monitoring ability. We can do arterial monitoring um, through the UAC. Um, we can monitor their temperature, we can monitor their end titles, we have all of that there. Um, transport, um, CPTS policy, anything under 44 weeks or corrected gestational age is done by us in the isolate. Um, after we stabilize the patient, 
we get to go and we that's why it takes us three or four hours because it takes us three or four hours to do this stuff um, because we create a little NICU um, if we're putting umbilical lines in we have to wait for their x-ray that's but we make sure they're stable before we put them in the isolate um, take them to the appropriate place um, NICU versus newborn nursery understand that there's different levels of each um, we are a level three NICU at Roanoke Memorial. Um, Montgomery now, I believe, is a level two NICU, which means they can keep some nasal cannulas. I think they can keep some CPAP um, for no more than 24 hours. Um, a special care nursery is somebody that can maintain an IV or that kind of stuff. Most of our nurseries around here can be considered a special care nursery. Um, Newborn nurseries are just your generic healthy newborns. That's where they but go. But in reality, we can go anywhere that will take a baby if they're that sick. Like coming back from Pioneer, if you had to stop somewhere. Yes, you can go to an ER. Yeah, anywhere you got to go is still okay, though. Yes. Okay. That's what uh, that. Yeah. Call the appropriate people. Make sure the neonatologist knows. Make sure we are on their way Yeah. to meet you wherever you're going. Um, but wherever you can get to is still okay. But um, those are the best choices if you get to choose. Now, the other, the other caveat to that is stay put. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a sick neonate and you don't think you're going to make it anywhere, stay put. Wait for the team to get there. Um, because you, it, it, you're in a stable environment with medical supplies. You get in the back of the truck, you're now in an unstable environment with limited medical supplies weigh your options that's what i was meaning i'm sorry like when you're in the back of the truck and things go bad you can stop wherever you gotta stop. oh absolutely yeah. stop yeah we yeah. we have the same rule like, like it doesn't matter that franklin doesn't have an, an a ER nursery. nursery it's the fact that it's an er exactly like they won't take an ob patient but the fact that it's an er yeah go there. and uh the neo pete's transport has had to stop and get out and a pure a uh, er room because we can't do what we're doing in the back of the ambulance anymore we need to get somewhere with a room um, and just call ahead open a room make sure you have somebody come to help you we don't live in a perfect world um, so in the event that this happens to you you're transporting mom she births the baby in the back of the truck just remember keep them warm maintain airway um, bag them the way you can bag them if all you got is a self-inflated bag don't give them too much. Make sure you're little. Make sure you're only doing chest rise. Don't pop them. Don't get excited. Um, clear that airway out. Um, and let them do stuff on their own. If they're doing it on their own, let them do it on their own. Don't get excited. Remember, they they compensate very well. And, you know, go through your ABCs, and once you get to a stopping point where they're, they're not doing it for themselves, that's when you, that's when you intervene. Um... Keep them secure. Um, we all know the mom chest thing is not appropriate. Um, so if this kid is born in an ambulance and you have no way to secure them, do the best you can. Strap them in the best you can. Get them to an ER so somebody can transport them appropriately. Um, I am still not 100% sure. I believe in the whole car seat stretcher thing. To me, it doesn't seem very safe, but... Do what you got to do um, and get them to the closest eating, just like you were saying. Um, we talked about the isolate. Uh, there's somebody's fancy isolate that I pulled off the internet. And you see most of everybody has exactly the same equipment. We There's low need um, out there for isolate, so everybody basically has the same because that one company is making them. I know nitric, like I said, nitric oxide is a drug that we do to uh, for pulmonary hypertension. It's a vasodilator, um, so we give it in line with our ventilators, um, and we bleed it in. 20 parts per million is where we usually start, um, and we have basically we just we have an extra tank hole in our tank setup, and we just throw the nitric tank in there. Um, do you cover Heliox? Heliox, we don't do that for neonates. Oh, I'll, okay. I'll, cover, I'll cover it in peds. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, nitric cell. Uh, nitric cell. 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 N
So if you ever get the frantic call, hey, we need the nitric and we're away from it, that's what it looks like. Um, the TXB, we talked about that, and it's a high frequency ventilator. Um, it's not quite the same and not quite as good as what we have in the hospital, but it does give us um, a lot of playing room uh, when we need it. It's very helpful. Keep them warm. <laughs> Uh, keep the airway open, keep them breathing, follow NRP and stable as much as you can. Oh, and my references, which were back there. Yeah, I got them. All right. Um, what, what questions do you have? What can I answer for you? Any scenarios you want to go over? I like what we did, actually. I really do, because I feel like we covered a lot. We covered a lot of what you do on, like, a daily basis kind of thing, and okay. things we're going to see a lot. What I read about the test stuff, it looked like the test stuff was a lot of it was what you do when the baby comes. Like, yeah. What's the first priority stuff is what it seemed to cover. Yeah, and that's that's what I tried. Oh, and that's what, gonna work. And that's what we, yeah. And that's what we hit, and that's what I was worried about. I was also worried, when I was reading into it, there was, there's all these drugs for adults, but there's not a lot listed on drugs in the book for testing, and then the test questions and, are more about what do you do for this baby? And, and the answer to that question is, as far as drugs, mm -hmm. we give very limited drugs. Um, so, Epi is your only code drug. Mm -hmm. um, it's 0.1 mLs per kilo of the 10 to 10,000 or 0 0.01 milligrams per kilo. I do the 0 0.1 mLs because it's quicker and it's faster and I don't have to do math. Um, of the 10 to 10,000. The, the one to one, one to, one to ten thousand. I'm sorry, I don't know why I said ten. So say that one more time. It's one point zero one mLs, milligrams per kilogram. kilogram of the one to ten thousand concentrations of epi. Okay. Um, the adult concentration is the one to a thousand. Okay. Yeah. Um, so newborn care, stimulate them, um, gently drying them. Don't get crazy. Um, if it's a preemie preemie, you wrap them in plastic. Don't dry them, you wrap them in plastic. Let their juices help them keep them warm. Um, remove the wet linen. A lot of people like to dry them and they leave the wet linen laying under them. Um, water, cold, that's not helping anything. Um, clear this, we talked about the bulb syringe, clear your airway. Um, place the baby on the maternal chest, is, that helps with warmth like nobody else. If they're breathing and they're stable. If not, get them under a radiant warmer, okay? You should have, if you know there's an imminent delivery happening, you should have some kind of warming device set up on pre-warmed. Um, if it's in the back of the truck and you don't have that wonderful option, use mom. Even if you're resuscitating, use mom. Open, open that shirt up, put it right there. Even if you have to resuscitate. Warmth is warmth, okay? Um, obviously to the point of airway, you know, breathing, that kind of thing. But you're gonna get a better result if that baby's warm than if you're gonna get when the baby's cold. Um, cover the infant's head in the hat. That's a lot of heat loss coming out of there. Um, they have most of their body, that's why I hate this baby because the head should be bigger. Most of their uh, heat loss is lost out of their head. Cover them in a hat. Um, the cord, um, this is kind of an old slide that I pulled off of another um, thing. Um, once the cord stops pulsating and the baby is breathing, that's when you apply the clamps, about seven to 10 inches away. Give a generous amount of room before you cut that cord, because um, if we have to do lines or whatever, we like a general, a good size cord. Um, they, can, they can make the cord pretty later. Um, Cut two clamps because you want to clamp it off to mom and the baby. Because um, if you don't, if you miss that second clamp, mom's going to bleed out through the placenta if it hasn't been delivered yet. Okay. Um, there is some research about delayed cord clamping and that kind of thing for your purposes. Don't, don't worry about it. Stops pulsating, the baby is breathing. You are hitting emergency situations, not perfect world with a birth plan. Uh, yeah, if they're in the back of the truck, I doubt. Yeah, your assessments um, should be every 15 minutes for at least an hour, more frequently if there's anything going wrong. Um, keep mom and baby close. 
remember your ID bands. Um, this is how babies get confused. Um, if you don't have ID bands, label them both with something. Something in your handwriting. Label mom, label baby. Some, somehow, some way. That way they can keep that and when they get to the hospital you can put birth baby bands on. Um, vitamin, oh, these are the meds. Erythromycin for the eyes, I ointment, and vitamin K to the thighs. So when you hear people say eyes and thighs, um, that's, those are the things. The erythromycin um, is standard uh, for anything. There's a lot of um, STDs that can cause blindness and the easy fix is just give them erythromycin right when they come out. And that's all you have to give it and they don't go blind. Um, vitamin K, um, it helps with clotting. So babies were bleeding out and dying um, for not having vitamin K. That's why we give it to all babies. Um, it's not, a, when, you, when the parents ask, it's not a vaccine. It is literally just a vitamin. It's a vitamin that our body normally produces. So if they're like, don't give my baby a vitamin, a vaccine, it's not a vaccine. And tell them if they don't have it, they'll bleed to death. Usually that convinces them. Um, they can deny it. All right, we talked about NRP and we talked about stable. Um, so I think that's about it. Um, I, had, I had some neuro slides if you would like to look at those. I skipped over them real quickly because I wanted to get some stuff in. Yeah, and I don't know why the recording's still going, honestly. It's supposed to cut off at That's great. Yeah. yeah, so it works out better. Yeah. Um, I have to go now, but. Yeah, have at it. Thanks for coming. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no problem. Bye, friend. Um, See you tomorrow. So, the neuro assessment. Um, Big things, fontanelles. Well, fontanelles are not the huge uh, initial neuro assessment. You have to work on the tone. Um, so here's a good picture of the difference in tone. Um, that's a flaccid baby, and that's a normal baby. You wow. see how they're pulling in? Um, don't worry about a moro reflex. Um, it, it's only later down the assessment. The nurses don't even do it. The doctors do it so they can put it in their chart. Don't worry about it. Um, they're cry. When they cry, is it, are they crying? And what it pitches it? If they have a high-pitched cry, like an abnormally high-pitched cry, that's when we worry about something is going wrong up there. Also, our drug-addicted babies will have a high-pitched cry, but you won't see the withdrawal symptoms until after, uh, a couple days after birth. Um, so, fontanelles. Fontanelles, there's two. There's the anterior and the posterior. Um, they should be flat. Um, sunken fontanelles indicate dehydration. Um, that means they're not, there's not enough cerebral spinal fluid to make that even. Um, bulging fontanelles means that there is something wrong inside. They have too much fluid. Either it's blood or something else going on. Um, so that's where you feel. Your sutures are here. Um, they line the front and the back. Um, it's just the plates. If there's normal sutures to be slightly separated, and by slightly, it's just a little, you know, you, you can barely feel a separation. Um, overriding sutures aren't necessarily abnormal. If they have molding from the birth canal, these things move, and that's fine. Um, but you have to be worried if, why are they, if there's other neuro things going on and you have these overriding sutures and like sunken fontanelles, do you have a problem? Are you missing something inside that head? Um, equal sutures, you'll see that in term neonates a little way down the road. That's fine and that's normal. Um, if they're significantly separated and that's probably going to give you also bulging fontanelles. There's something, there's too much of something in that head. Uh, birth injuries. This is probably something you're going to see more often. That's normal. That's normal molding. I've sat in the canal a little ways. Um, great for my anatomy, um, for letting me get through that birth canal. A cap it. Um, a caput is just a little hematoma, like above the skull, in between the scalp. 
um, causing like a lump, um, a bruise, um, and that is also frequent and normal. You'll see that occasionally with some vacuum or that, whatever. Um, a cephalohematoma, um, the difference with the cephalohematoma is that it is a little lower, it's going to get more blood flow, and it's going to get bigger, and it's going to look like a big giant bruise. I'm trying to say cephalohematoma, and the cephalohematoma will cross the suture line where a caput won't. I'm sorry, I think I misspoke earlier where I said the cephalohematoma won't cross the suture lines, but they will. Um, they're going to be a little boggier. They don't get bigger. When you get out and they're there, that's about as big as they're going to get. And the subgalium bleed, that's the scary one. It keeps bleeding. They're going to need blood products. They're, they have a massive hemorrhage in their head. And they're just bleeding and bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. Um, they're going to become shocky real fast. They're going to lose their respiratory drive real fast. Um, they might come out relatively normal, and then you think it's just like a cephalohematoma or a caput, and then it starts getting bigger. Um, so the neural tube defects, there's so much that can go wrong uh, in as these kids are developing in utero. Um, in the first trimester, folic acid is very important. That's why we say anybody that might think they ever think they want a child ever, um, and they're in childbearing years, so just go ahead and take a multivitamin with folic acid. Um, or if you have the ability to get pregnant at all, um, you should probably just take some folic acid because uh, this happens in the first trimester. Um, so myelomeningocele is basically that top one. People call it spina bifida. Um, it is the spinal cord, the sac of the spinal cord is outside of the body. Um, it's repairable. Um, these kids have to be prone. You cannot put them on their back. So however you can figure out how to transport them, get them transported on their belly. Um, keep that wet and dry. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Keep that wet, moist, uh, using some sterile saline or gauze. Keep it warm. Um, they'll lose a lot of heat out of that defect. That's a pretty significant one. It looks like a big giant bubble on the back of their, on their back. Um, that's anencephaly. That's they, this is this extreme version of that. They basically either don't have a brain or only have a spinal cord and their head will be pretty flat. Um, microcephaly is, we're seeing that a lot now with the Zika virus. Um, basically they, these little guys have a tiny head um, and probably not a complete developed brain. Um, they might be able to breathe on their own, they might be able to eat on their own, and time will tell what they can do developmentally. Um, I don't know if you watched uh, American Horror Story, the pinheads from the circus, those are microcephaly. Yeah. Um, we talked about anencephaly. Hydrocephaly, that's the kids with the big large head, um, that means for some reason, they have an overproduction of CSF in their that is produced in their head, um, and it either there's a leak or they just have an overproduction, and so their head becomes that way. Um, in kids that are in the NICU um, and they're extreme premature, we have so you have congenital hydrocephaly. They came out with it that way, and that's what that was happened to them, um, or they have had an intraventricular hemorrhage um, and what's in, in their uh, ventricles are so swollen and so full of either blood or spinal fluid um, that they have hydrocephaly from that. Um, both of them are going to need uh, a VP shunt, a ventricular peritoneal shunt. Uh, 